Welcome to this illustrative mathematics webinar. Today, we will be looking at the K-5 mathematics curriculum and its various components. At Illustrative, we're committed to creating a world where all learners know, use, and enjoy mathematics. And this is done through a coherent and aligned K-12 mathematical experience for both students and teachers. The development of this curriculum was founded on particular beliefs about teaching and learning. These include ideas about curiosity, access to grade level math, students learning math by making sense of problems, collaboration, communication, students learning language as they develop mathematical understandings, to name a few. The topics that will be covered in this webinar are what does problem-based learning look like, the instructional routines and centers that are an essential part of this curriculum, the features that make this an accessible curriculum for all students, the basic curriculum structure, the various components of assessment, and the professional learning opportunities. IMK5 is a problem-based curriculum, but what exactly does that mean and what does it look like? In a problem-based curriculum, students learn mathematics as a result of solving problems. The mathematical ideas that arise are the outcomes of the problem-solving experience rather than the elements that must be taught before problem-solving. With this in mind, the overarching design and structure of the curriculum begins with an invitation to the mathematics. This is followed by a deep study of concepts and procedures, and this is followed by consolidating and applying those concepts. This structure is reflected at every level of the curriculum, from the activity level to the lesson level to the unit level and the course level. So let's take a little closer look at the structure of a lesson. Each lesson is designed to be 60 minutes long, and there are similarities and some slight differences that happen at K1 and grades 2-5. We'll start with grades 2-5 on the right-hand side of the screen. The components in this structure of the lesson begins with a warm-up. This is the invitation to the mathematics, and it launches students into the activities of the lesson. The warm-up is followed by a couple of activities, each of which are synthesized. And this is wrapped up with a lesson synthesis. Following the lesson synthesis is a cool down where teachers have the opportunity to see where the lesson landed for the students. The green line indicates that centers at grades two through five happen outside of the 60 minute lesson. In grades K1 on the left hand side, you can see that centers are incorporated in the 60 minute lesson structure as one of the activities. The other difference is that at the end of the lesson, there's an opportunity for cool downs, but also for lesson observations. Let's look more specifically at a particular third grade lesson. Each lesson begins with a student facing goal that's framed as a let's statement. And this is left purposely vague, so it doesn't give away the goal of the lesson before students have a chance to engage in the mathematics. In this lesson, the warm up is which one doesn't belong. This is one of eight different warm-up routines, which we will look at a little bit later in this webinar. In Which One Doesn't Belong, students are invited to think about one of the figures that they think doesn't belong and to give a reason why. There's no right or wrong answer to the warm-up in Which One Doesn't Belong, and it gives teachers an opportunity to see what prior knowledge, experiences, and language that students are bringing to the day's lesson. The warm-up is followed by an activity. In this activity, Students are asked to use square tiles to find the areas of rectangles. In some cases, the tiles have gaps or there's overlaps. And in adjusting these, it helps students solidify the idea that the area of a rectangle is the number of square units that are needed to cover the rectangle without gaps or overlaps. The synthesis of this first activity asks students to consider why some of the square tiles needed to be adjusted in order to find the area of the rectangle. In the next activity, students will do a card sort, and it's launched with a notice and wonder because this activity is a bit more abstract than the first one. Students are given a set of rectangles and asked to sort them in any way that makes sense to them, and they need to be prepared to explain why they sorted them in the categories that they did. Students are also asked to create a new rectangle that could fit into each of the categories they created. 
In the synthesis, students are invited to explain how they sorted their rectangles and what decisions that they made in creating those categories. They also are asked to explain how they know that the rectangles that they created fit into the categories that they chose. The lesson synthesis wraps up the learning of the lesson. And in this synthesis, students are asked, what are some helpful features of rectangles that help us to find their area? And what's amplified here is that by counting and knowing the side length of a rectangle, it can help you find its area. The final piece is the cool down. This is an opportunity for teachers to see individually where students landed with the learning of the day. This is a formative assessment, and it takes about five minutes at the end of a lesson. In this cool down, Priya is explaining that this rectangle has an area of 23 square units, and students need to explain why they either agree or disagree with Priya. So let's take a look at this cycle of problem-based teaching and learning. You can see that at the beginning, the role of the teacher is to make sure that students understand what the question in the activity is that they will engage in. In the next two parts, students work individually, and they also work with either partners or in small groups. And the role of the teacher here is to monitor, to listen, and to ask questions so that they can understand what students are thinking. And in the final piece of this cycle, the teacher helps students synthesize their learning by making connections to the activities and the concepts that they engaged with. So let's look back at that original overarching design structure that we saw earlier. You can see that in this lesson, the invitation to the mathematics begins with the warm-up routine of which one doesn't belong. And this is followed by the deep study of concepts and procedures, which were the two activities in learning about areas of rectangles. And the final piece happened in the lesson synthesis and in the cool down, where the learning is consolidated and applied. This design structure, as mentioned earlier, is reflected at every level of the curriculum, from the activity level, to the lesson level, to the unit level. Next, let's take a look at the instructional routines and centers that are embedded into the lessons of the IMK5 curriculum. Every lesson begins with an instructional routine, the warm-up, which lasts 10 minutes and is meant to be an invitation to the mathematics. They're designed for all students to be engaged and to contribute, for students to think and communicate mathematically. They're also purposefully introduced with a predictable structure so they can become truly routine. They allow for a focus on student thinking and the mathematical ideas. They support access to the mathematics and they're aligned to the learning goals. Here are some of the routines that you'll find in K-5. There's estimation exploration, Act It Out is a kindergarten routine where students are read a scenario and invited to act it out. In How Many Do You See, students are given a visual of a number of objects and asked to say how many they see and how they see them. We saw which one doesn't belong in the lesson earlier in this webinar. In True or False, students are asked to consider if an equation is true or if it's false and to defend their answer. And Notice and Wonder simply asks students to list what they notice and what they wonder about a picture or a diagram. This is a full list of all the routines that you'll see in the K-5 curriculum. A few are particular to just kindergarten, and True or False is only found in grades 1 through 5. Next, let's take a look at the centers and the role that they play in the curriculum. The purpose of the centers is to allow for extra practice of skills or concepts that's connected to the learning goals. And the second purpose is to help build fluency across a year. Every unit comes with a set of highly flexible and engaging centers. Teachers are able to relate learning experiences in order to meet each student's needs. They're organized by content focus, and they have multiple stages that are designed as the progression of learning. In kindergarten, the centers are built into that 60-minute lesson structure. In first grade, there is one whole lesson that is strictly about centers, that happens at the end of each section within the unit. And in second through fifth grade, the centers are designed to be used outside of the 60 minute lesson. This diagram shows what is meant by stages of a center. In this case, which one is a geometry center that's played in various stages from kindergarten through fifth grade. Generally, the directions stay the same for the center, but as they move through the stages, it increases in complexity. Where in kindergarten, the center is played with circles and squares and triangles. 
And by the time they get to fifth grade, they are using a variety of quadrilaterals and being able to explain the attributes of those different quadrilaterals and various polygons. Let's look at some specific features that allow access for all students within the curriculum. At every grade level in the first unit, there are embedded structures in the first six to seven lessons that allow teachers to establish building their mathematical community. Students are continually asked what does it look like and sound like to do math together as a mathematical community? And then collectively, they build a list of norms or expectations that they need to be mindful of in order to do math together in their mathematical community. There are also access for English learners written into the math language routines. These are written directly into the lesson plans at the activity level. There are eight different math language routines. And while they are written as access for English learners, they're helpful for all learners in the classroom. Also at the activity level are written in access for students with disabilities, and these address areas of cognitive functioning. They're also specific to the activity and what is needed for students to engage in the math. These accesses for students with disabilities are not about different tasks for just certain students. These are also not tier two or tier three interventions. They're not meant to address unfinished learning from previous grades, and they're not for use outside of the general education classroom. What they are is they do provide access to tier one instruction. They are meant to maintain the cognitive demand of the curriculum. They're to be useful for all learners, and they're meant to reduce barriers and to maximize learning. We also believe in giving students practice problems, and there are three types that are found in the curriculum. Pre-unit problems give teachers an opportunity to see what students know and are able to do before a unit of study. There are practice problems that are aligned to the lessons, and there are also exploration problems which extend the learning and thinking happening within a particular unit and lessons. Let's look at the curriculum structure organization. Every unit of study is made up of two to four sections, and within every section, there's a collection of four to seven lessons. If we look back at the lesson that we did at third grade, you can see that it is part of the second unit on area and multiplication. This unit has three different sections, and the lesson that we did was the third lesson in section A. There's a total of four lessons within that section. And if we zoom out a little further, here are all the units of study at third grade also listed are the ones for fourth and fifth grade. And you can see this follows the same design of invitation to the mathematics, where the first unit of study is inviting students to consider the mathematics for the entire year. In third grade, with introducing multiplication, students are working with scaled bar graphs as they collect and organize data about their classmates. In fourth grade, with factors and multiples, students are using square tiles as they are learning about their concepts. And in fifth grade, with finding volume, students are working with unit cubes and connecting cubes in order to understand the volume of rectangular prisms. The bulk of the units of the year are the major work of that grade level. And the final unit is a putting it all together unit where all the concepts and math they did for the year are integrated into applying and consolidating their experiences. In grades K through two, the same structure is reflected here. You can see that the first unit of study is an invitation to the mathematics with math in our world. In first and second grade, students are collecting data about their classmates as they learn how to organize that information. And the final unit is once again, a putting it all together unit that ties together their learnings from the year. Let's take a look at the different components of assessment that you'll find in the K-5 curriculum. As you can see in this diagram, there are many opportunities for assessment throughout. There are opportunities during a lesson through the cool downs and center observations. There are opportunities at the beginning and end of the unit with pre-unit practice problems and end of unit assessments. And also there are opportunities across the unit with the section checkpoints. So more specifically, this is an example of a pre-unit practice problem that's tied to the lesson that we looked at at the beginning of the webinar. 
These rely on second grade understandings and it helps give teachers an opportunity to see what students know about arrays or about skip counting. There's a cool down for every lesson every day. And as teachers collect these cool downs, it helps them to look at how this lesson can be adjusted in the following day. So written into the lessons are these next day supports and also prior unit supports. The section checkpoints occur across the unit. This is an example of a section checkpoint item for sections A and one for section B and one for section C. These are like extended cooldowns and the section checkpoints have anywhere from two to four items. The end of unit assessments have anywhere from four to eight different items. This is an example of one of the items found at the end of unit assessment related to the lesson that we looked at earlier. In this final piece, let's look at the opportunities for learning through the work of teaching and the professional learning opportunities that are on offer. Let's take a moment and look back at the third grade lesson and this diagram that really describes this problem-based teaching and learning process. You can see that the role of the teacher, there's really an emphasis about how as teachers, we monitor, listen, and ask questions in order to help students surface new mathematical ideas and make connections in their learning. And to support this type of teaching, written into the curriculum are these very detailed mathematical narratives. The narratives outline the purpose of each piece or the goals and also describes what students will be doing. There's also some descriptions about the types of students' responses to the activities and suggested synthesis questions. And these detailed mathematical narratives can be found at every level from describing the activity to laying out an entire lesson to capturing what the section is about and also an entire unit. Also written into the curriculum are these various teacher reflection questions, and they fall under four different categories, pedagogy, student thinking, math content, and beliefs and positioning. And as one example for beliefs and positioning, a question for a teacher to reflect on could be, as your students worked in small groups, whose ideas were heard, valued, and accepted? And how can you adjust the group structure tomorrow to ensure each student's ideas are a part of the collective learning? And finally, outside of the written curriculum, there are these various professional learning topics and sessions that are offered through your curriculum partner. There are sessions about exploring a lesson, about planning and learning with teachers. There are ones on rehearsing various routines. There are professional learning sessions on diving into the progressions and the representations, responding to student thinking, and adapting lessons. So thank you for joining me on this webinar of the curriculum. On the left-hand side, you can see the various ways you can connect with us on social media. And on the right, there are some really great blog posts written by our former director and various teachers and facilitators who are using the curriculum. Thank you once again.